elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, laying on hand, of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment is all about end time. So this church, this he, the church in Hebrew, whatever that church might be, probably made up of a lot of Jews, I'm thinking, um, Jewish believers, that is, um, they call this end time study elementary principles. So I want to share some elementary principles today uh, about the end time, but I want to link that with Israel. Um, the reason why I got into um, s thinking and studying and meditating upon this is because I'm actually from House of Prayer. Uh, my DNA is House of Prayer. And I wanted to know how I should be praying for Israel. And I know that a lot of people um, have Israel, like pro-Israel. So everything that Israel do does is like waving their flags and yay. But I'm not sure whether that's how we should be praying, uh, biblically speaking. So I, I went, I've been wanting to do this for a long, long, long time. But I had uh, some time off uh, for the last six months. So I was able to delve into it. And I, I'm really glad to share some of the things that I actually found. I'm not saying I've got it all together, but I'd like to share what I, uh, what I have discovered, uh, biblically speaking. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like you to um, receive it and think about it. Search it for yourself in the, in the Bible. And also when you pray, think about how you should be praying for Israel in this time. Now, I know a lot of people here are intercessors. And when you are, or prayers at least, when you're actually praying for things and yet that's not in alignment with God's will, what happens to that prayer? Don't you sometimes get a little bit fearful that when you're praying for something and you think, is this aligned with God? Just because it just comes out of your thought doesn't mean that's aligned with what God wants, right? So how do we actually rectify that? The best way to do that is if you find it in scripture, contextually, right, okay, not just any one word or something like that, but contextually right in alignment with the plan of God and the prophecies of God or the promises of God, then you are 100% it. You can rely uh, on God that that will be fulfilled. Whether it will be soon or later, it will be. So what you want to do is, if you want to pray for Israel, for example, is that you want to find exactly... Uh, how God sees the plan of God and the fulfillment of his prophecies for Israel. If you pray that, then you, you know that you're in agreement with God. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So what I, that's what I wanted to do. Well, not for myself first, and then you. Jews first? No, no. <laughs> I'm not a Jew. Okay, Jews first and Gentile. But no, it's me. me because I wanted to, I want to pray right before the Lord in agreement with God. And then I want to share that with you today. Okay, but if you... If, we can't, the other thing is that when we actually pray, we also have to know, like sons of Issachar, intercessors has to be sons of Issachar. It's not, it's impossible not to be uh, sons of Issachar and intercess, intercede. Because if you don't know wh where you are in, in the uh, timeline of uh, restoration of Israel, then you might be praying wrong, at wrong time. Like you can't have Jeremiah's prayer at Moses' time, can you? Or Moses' prayer at Jeremiah's time, can you? even though they're all in the Bible. So the other thing is, you have to know where we're at. We, we've got to be sons of Israel. In fact, it doesn't matter if you're, in, you, if you're a Christian, you should actually have some kind of understanding of where you're li living in time, timeline of God. Okay, timeline of God. Amen? Yes. <laughs> I don't usually do that, but yeah. Uh, so I, I've, I've got a nice presentation, PowerPoint. <laughs> I, I used to be an engineer, so <laughs> I, have really, I have a really nice diagram. So uh, it's actually for tomorrow. Okay, the thing is this. I have, uh, I wanted to do something tonight because I'm actually doing it tonight, something climactic today, but I can't because I have to kind of, you know, like a plane taking off. You can't go at the high when you, if you're uh, still, you know, taking off. So um, I have to lay the foundation of the climax that's coming. It will be tomorrow. But I mean, hopefully it will be climax all the time, but, uh, <laughs> but it, tonight will be very uh, like an elementary teaching tonight about end time that actually sets up with the, uh, that links, links with Israel, okay? 
And so, so to, uh, I'll actually go through the PowerPoint because that's why I'm kind of talking ahead. So let me pray first. Eh? So Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your heart for us as a church. But we know because of your heart for the church is same for Israel. Father, we want to know your desired heart and the, and the spiritual understanding of how you want to want to pan out the plan of God. We want to also know the heart of God towards Israel. So we can't, we, we, you said, Lord, the worship, true worshipers cannot worship without spirit and truth. We want both, Lord and Lady God. We want the word of the truth so that we may know what in our mind we need to pray for. But we want to have the heart that comes from the very heart of God, the spirit of God, to touch us and make us experience how you feel about Israel so we can actually pray with zeal as well as knowledge, as Romans uh, 10 says, Lord. So, Father, we, 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 give, we give you thanks tonight for the revelation that is going to uh, come from the Holy Spirit through my mouth, in the Word, so that people may know uh, you first, but also your desire for Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Here we go. So, focus. Maybe someone taking focus. The ultimate goal or the objective of the talk is this. Firstly, to be able to pray for Israel with the right biblical knowledge. Okay, this is the objective that I want to get to at the end. In agreement with his promises, plans, and prophecies. Okay? Because we want to know the biblical knowledge of what God says about Israel so that we can have agreement with him, as I said before. And secondly, with the heart of God for Israel, for his glory. And the reason why I say that is because I think a lot of people, rather than glorifying God when they pray for Israel, they glorify Israel. I mean, there's a lot of things, not just for Israel, but many things like that. Do you know? Yeah. I'm a teacher. So, look, I just, I, I had a thought before. So, so, this is us. All right? And this is God. And if this is Israel, right? Who's, who's, who's pictorial people? I'm a picture person. So, when we actually see Israel, right? That's, Okay? We need to see the way God sees it, right? And the way he sees it is through the word of God. Would you agree? So we have two choices. We can actually look at Israel through the word of God or through our own way. Yeah, our, our desire, let's call it. Someone prayed about that today. There's two ways to look at it, all right? But God always looks at uh, Israel through his plans and prophecies in the word of God. But we need to do the same. Now, if we do it through the Word of God, we glorify God. But if we do it through our desire, do you know what God becomes? He becomes our tool. He becomes our means. It happens all the time in the prayer. You don't want God to be your means. He has to be your end. Okay, I, actually, I think I taught this before. But if, if we have Israel, if we glorify Israel, then God becomes the means, just a tool in our belt, then you're going to make a disastrous, uh, you're going to have a problem, basically. So that was the glory of God, right? <laughs> so for the glory of God, so it's, we don't use God as a means. We use him as, a, he's the end. You know, we pray for Israel for the glory of God, not glory of Israel. We've got, really got to be very careful. And, and thirdly, with a fitting posture and positioning of intercession. What is the right posture we've got to have as an intercessor? That is really important. And uh, knowing, and that will require knowing the time and season that we're living in and so on. All right, so that's my objective. And then I'd like to do this through the pattern that, that I actually read in the Romans 9 to 11. Now, I think, I mean, where do you see um, Israel talked about in the New Testament? The greatest portion, I don't know what, maybe the only portion that is, is in the Romans 9 to 11, right? So that is, if you read that carefully, you can pray a lot from there. Romans 9 to 11 is probably the best New Testament pattern to pray for Israel. Mm -hmm. So if you actually understand Romans 9 to 11, in fact, if anybody comes later on, I have kind of an outline of Romans 9 to 11. I can dish that out to another time. But, um, so really... 
Romans 9 to 11 pattern that I actually use to uh, structure the uh, talk today uh, and, to, and next two days. So understanding what the Bible says about Israel's restoration, so like what we talked about before, so that it's, it says in Romans 10, 2 and 11, 25, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to the knowledge, according to knowledge. Who is he talking about? They is Israel. Israel is saying they actually have zeal for the Lord, but they don't have the knowledge, so they can't be saved. That's a huge thing if you don't know them. I'm not saying knowledge is everything. I'm not talking about intellectual knowledge is everything. In fact, uh, intellectual knowledge itself alone is not going to do either. But what I am saying, if we don't have the true knowledge of God, then we, we, if we don't know the truth, then we can't be set free, as they say, right? So the second one is, for I do not desire, and Paul is uh, speaking to the Roman church, he says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ig you should be ignorant of this mystery. So I don't want you to be ignorant about the mystery of Israel. Otherwise, you, you won't be able to pray for them. And you won't yeah. know what, how that Israel fits in. So you've got to have understanding and knowledge as well. My wife is sitting there and she just reminded me that, she didn't, but I'm reminded of, for me to speak slowly. <laughs> okay. Speak slowly, Steve. All right, good. <coughs> Secondly, receiving the heart. And if you talk about heart, you've got to talk about emotions of God. And I, I know I got this from Mike Bickle, obviously, but emo emotions of God is so important. How he feels about you, how he feels about your wife and your children or your husband, extremely, in the same way, how you feel about Israel, how God feels about Israel, if you actually receive that, you are able to pray in the same emotion with, with God. If you want this light, I'll give it to you, send it to you, all right? So you can have it. Um, so you don't need to write it all down. No, don't take photos. I can give me your email, I'll send it to you. It's all yours, free. Like Mike Bickle, you know? My copyright is right to copy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, emotions of God. Uh, in Romans 11, 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. That's certainly not. It's not, okay, certainly not. No, certainly not. That's the emotion of God, okay? That Paul is expressing, and there's more in that uh, place. Okay, and thirdly, acquiring a fitting posture in intercession for Israel. And uh, the greatest uh, um, advice that I got from a guy called Dean Knight about intercession is whatever you pray for, let's say um, I'm praying for my wife, Alice's life for my life. Can you pray like that? For anything? Have you ever prayed like that? Yeah. So that, I think that's how Paul feels about Israel. It's, uh, it's missing at the bottom. Here. For I could wish that I myself was a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Same with Moses. Blot me out. Yeah. If you're not going to uh, save my people, or save your people, really. And so in the same way, I think the true intercession, if we go deep enough uh, in the Lord, you will have to lay down your life for it, all right? And I, I kept on saying that the greatest intercession is not prayer. Intercession is not all about prayer. What is it? Greatest intercession is the cross. Jesus didn't pray the cross. He lived the cross and he died on the cross. That's the greatest intercession. So the true intercession has to die for you to die. Unless a, a seed falls and dies, you cannot produce more, right? So intercession, true intercession is death. Okay? So that's a fitting intercession. So we're going to, do you want to go there? <laughs> intercession. I, 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 three times I prayed like that in my life. I'm still alive. Okay. God didn't kill me. I, I thought he would, but he, he didn't. So. so the following is the outline of my talk. Fundamentals of God's end time plan. So I'm going to talk about these things. House of prayer and end time. A little bit of that. Uh, some important end time events. Okay. And various views on the end time events. Okay. Because the reason I would do this is because I need to um, draw a timeline. And I had to have a certain position to draw that timeline. So I want to explain to you there are various ways to look at end time. Uh, and um, I, I'm taking certain position in that. Okay, and I'll give you why that I, I have that take position. So I don't want to be by. I know that a lot of people have uh, different views. Um, so I'm actually respectful of all those views, okay, unless it's not in the Bible. 
Um, but uh, I, I just want to give you my perspective, and I have to kind of come through that so that I can talk about Israel and so on. How Israel fits in the scheme of the God's end time plan. Okay, that's important, isn't it? So connection between end time and Israel restoration, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow, judgment and restoration of Israel. It's, yeah, you, you need to talk both. Not, you can't just say restoration. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Mm. It's in the Old Testament, right? Mm. When Israel goes astray, right, what does God do? The first thing he does is he sends prophets. He says, mm. you're going astray, okay? Don't go astray. Come back to me. Repent. And he, he does it often and, and continuously. And then he says, if you don't do this, what, what does he do? He brings judgment on Israel, right? And then he, say, he talks about restoration. Okay, he doesn't bypass judgment. You will see. It's a pat, continuous pattern in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, the, this is the thing. Israel now, are they God-fearing nation? Not all of them. So there you go. There's a bit of a hint. All right. Acquiring a fitting posture to intercede. Okay. I'll go back and just say, so how is God going to restore Israel? Okay. That's the question. And that's what I want to talk about tomorrow morning. Okay. Acquiring a fitting pos posture for inter uh, to intercede for Israel. Meditating on how God feels about Israel. How important is Israel to God and hence to me. Okay. So at the end, to be on... Israel's side means to be on God's side. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. All right, so. All right, let's go into the talk, introduction. Do you like the picture? I always put a picture in it. I always put pictures just to give you. It's important, isn't it? Where you actually turn the light on there. Introduction, end time, okay. Let's talk from, uh, from the House of Prayer point of view. Two biblical or theological pillars of House of Prayer is intimacy and end time. Do you know? Intimacy is all about first commandment and end time is about return of Jesus. And I want to define what eschatology or end time study is. So intimacy is about first commandment and I believe house is one of the primary reasons, maybe the primary reason uh, for house of prayer, God raising up house of prayer, is to restore first commandment in the first place in the churches. That's how I see it. Okay. Lifestyle house of prayer is about doing what? what we talk about today, ministering to the Lord, which is the first commandment. Okay? That needs to be restored in the churches. Why? Because Jesus is coming back soon. And he's coming back as judge, king, and a bride. And the bride. And if he's coming as the bride, then the, bri the no, sorry, bride... Not, bridegroom. Sorry. <laughs> bridegroom. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> if he's coming back as the bridegroom, if I had a drink coffee, I'm going to not sleep tonight and I'll miss the tomorrow session yeah. <laughs> so if he's coming back as the bridegroom the bridegroom then we need to prepare ourselves as bride and what is the primary objective of the bride to fall in love with the bridegroom and therefore the first command must be restored for Jesus to be returning does that make sense that's the first commandment that has to be restored in the first place in the church. And that is why God is raising up many, many houses of prayer. And many, in fact, houses of prayer need to do that, apart from everything else. And people say, oh, what about intercession? Well, inter intercession must come from intimacy. Okay? You must. It, it has to be. Okay? Even though you might not think, have I been intimacy? If you're an intercessor, then you already have. Because probably you're very close to the Lord and you're hearing him, not to hearing him, but he, feeling the heart of God. Okay? So, and, and the end time is just about Jesus returning. And those people who are intimate with Jesus say, come please, quickly. Spirit and the bride say, come, quickly. You know, Song of Songs ends in the end with that. Spirit and, 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 the, and the bride said, come. Song of Song ends like that, do you know? Mm -hmm. and so, the return of Jesus and all about the return of Jesus is the end time study. And I'll, I'll explain that a bit more. So those two are the two pillars of House of Prayer. That's what we do. And the reason why we want Jesus to come back, the way we want Jesus to come back as a House of Prayer is to pray. Lord, accomplish this, accomplish this. Great commission, whatever. Restore the church, restore Israel, and so on. We pray these things so that Jesus will come quickly, hastily. And that's the the work of the house of prayer yeah do people 
Do you, I mean, I know that some people, and not in this room, but some people think House of Prayer, International House of Prayer and so on, are like heresy and all that stuff. I mean, how can this be heresy? What I just described to you. Do you know? So anyway, that's my two cents worth of a House of Prayer advertisement. <laughs> so come to Lions Row House of Prayer, please. <laughs> so are we two related? All right, here we go. So two kind, I just want to explain eschatology or, or the end time study. So I want to... Uh, give you two comings of Jesus. So first coming uh, in Galatians 4 4 says, 4, 4, 4 says this. Slow down. Ellis says. <laughs> but when the fullness of the ta time, or this time is chronos in Greek, period of time, had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, or a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Which, which coming is this? The first one or the second coming? It's the first coming, right? So, the first coming, did you, you know, like, you know, a conversation between father and son, saying, oh, I think it's about time I went, Gee, God. What do you reckon? Today? Do you reckon today is a good day? Do you think that, that happened or something else happened? There was a plan, a time. So what this means is when the fullness of time, when, when the, the time became full, that's what it means, chronos, the actual period of time, the duration of time. And when it became full, that's when Jesus came. So the first coming wasn't like random time. It was certain time that God has planned in that fullness of time. Do you think second coming is a bit like that? Mm. Yeah, I'll give you a verse for that. So second coming in Ephesians 1.10. Ephesians, great book, unbelievable book. Probably one of the best books for a mystery of the gospel and Christ and even Jews and Gentiles, church and stuff. Okay, so let me read that. It's a, Ephesians 1 is like one long sentence, <laughs> about 10 verses. Uh, in Greek, if you read it. So, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Do you know what this means? He talks about mystery of Christ and mystery of gospel in chapter 2 and 3. Yeah? And that, what that means is that, very easily, mystery, when he talks about mystery in the Bible, and that doesn't come out very often in the New Testament, it means what is, revealed, uh, what is hidden in the Old Testament has been revealed in the New Testament. That's all it means. Okay? So mystery means what? Old Testament that was hidden, which people didn't know, know about in Old Testament, that has been revealed in New Testament, so people now, when you read New Testament, understand what happened, ha happened what they were talking about in the Old Testament. So mystery of Christ means that uh, the Christ came and it was a kind of a very big surprise for Jews. I'm actually digressing, can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, thanks, mate. <laughs> I have his approval, Glenn, all right? A little bit, a little bit. So when Jesus came, Jews were surprised because they were expecting a Messiah who is going to crush all the enemies of Jews and bring Jews up as the top of the world and he was going to rule from Jerusalem. But when Jesus came, he was not doing that. So they were shocked. How can I believe this Messiah? All he's doing is fixing people up, you know, and, and preaching this gospel thing. And they had never heard of this. And he dies on the cross. So everybody scatters, right? So that's the Messiah. And that's the mystery because they actually thought as soon as Jesus comes, the Messianic kingdom will start. But it didn't. It had a time period where there's a so-called church age. And then later on Messiah will come and he will set up the Messianic Kingdom. The New Testament for Messianic Kingdom is Millennium Kingdom. That's how it fits. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, good. Uh, we'll give you that chat later on as well. So let me just keep on going. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, this is a really hard word. What dispensation? It's kind of plan, okay? It's, sometimes they call it fellowship, but really it's more plan. Dispensation of the fullness or completeness of the times. It's plural. And this is not chronos. This is kairos. And kairos is more like uh, times, seasons, or even events. So in other words, this. What is uh, he might, that he might... Gather together in one, in all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. So which, what is this? When certain time in the, in the future, there will be a time when God will put everything in heaven and earth together under Christ. Mm -hmm. 
When will that be? When he returns. Yeah? This is second coming. And when will that happen? When this fullness of the periods, or not, sorry, not periods, fullness or completeness of these events and seasons and times is complete. Fulfilled. So these certain events need to happen before Jesus comes. Does that make sense? And this is what end time study is. So let me summarize, summarize that. Eschatology or the end time study is all about studying the events, times and seasons centered around the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and how he will finally and fully restore his kingdom. That's what eschatology is. Okay? Should we know that? Yes. Or would you like to know that? Yes. Well then study it. <laughs> Read the book of Revelation. Don't just, please don't rely on teachers and you know like, yes, to get some ideas. If you want to study end time, read the Bible. Okay? And the teachers, like Glenn and other people, will come and help you to understand them. But you will not be able to understand and actually have, have it for yourself unless you actually do it yourself, if you don't study it. And I always say that. When I preach, okay, I'm, I'm speaking out of my first-hand experience, either encountering God or, or through the Word. But when you hear it, you will hear it a second time, and it's a second-hand message. Unless you yourself go home and pray and seek the word, then it will not be your message, it's my message. Don't, don't think just because you heard John Piper's and Mike Bickles and Bill Johnson, whatever it is that you just heard it, just because you hear them, doesn't mean that's your message. That's not, that's not yours. So that's why I prayed like, like when Glenn was praying this morning. Raise up these people who actually will be in Matthew 6.6. 6. Matthew 6 is the one when you pray, going to the locked door, behind the locked door, going to the room by yourself, turn off your iPhone, everything else, and just seek the Lord with the word in prayer, and he will reward you. His reward is himself. He will bring revelation of who he is to you. And that is the greatest revelation that you'll ever have. Okay? And he will tell you things if you actually open up the word and ask him things. The same Holy Spirit who actually wrote the word is in you, and he'll reveal things to you if you are persevering in it. It's not an instantaneous like what we talk about, microwaves and all that stuff. All right. So, what are some important uh, end time events? End time events? Some of the uh, important end time events? Rapture? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, let's uh, talk about the big pictures. Rapture. What's rapture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is rapture and the second coming the same? They're not. Okay, so you need to distinguish that, okay? I'll, we'll talk about more about it as we go. Second coming of Jesus, of course, very important. Millennium Kingdom is another big reference point, really. Tribulation, the Great Tribulation. Seven-year tribulation that uh, Daniel 9 is talking about, uh, as well as um, in the Re Revelation, the Revelation as well. Uh, three judgments in Revelation. Three judgments. Seal, trumpet, bowl, okay? And Israel, Israel's restoration. So these are, I'm talking about more reference points in, in the timeline, okay, in the end time. So I'll, I'll show you how that all fits in. Okay, Glenn is very strict with the time. So how, how much time do I have left? Have I gone over the time already? You got no? Half an hour. Ah, good, <laughs> half an hour, long time. These three are very connected. The last red part. Tribulation. Three judgments in Revelation. Some people think three judgments in Revelation fits it within the seven years. Some people think it's a bit more than that before. So it just depends on the uh, things. And uh, Israel restoration. Of course it's important because Israel's restoration means beginning of the Millennium Kingdom. Okay? Or Messianic Kingdom. Okay? And Messianic Kingdom or Israel's restoration won't happen until Second Coming. Because... Unless the, the Israelite says, Blessed is the name of the Lord. Oh, sorry, Blessed is the Blessed Lord who comes in the name of the Lord. If that, unless that happens, it's not going to happen. Okay. And rapture is for the church. So, so uh, Let me just uh, give you some interpretation. So two major factors um, for different interpretations deriving from the, the two essential points is this. Uh, well, so two important points. Sorry. Two points that actually determines how you view the end time. The first one is 
how we view Israel from the New Testament perspective. Okay, I'm going to talk more about that a bit later on. But what are two, basically two major view? One is the replacement theology. Yeah, what's that? There's a church to replace Israel. Yeah, everything that in the Old Testament promises to Israel has now become the churches. Mm. You try to interpret Old Testament like that, it's extremely hard. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And the other one is taking it uh, as uh, Israel's restoration. Okay, second one is how we read the book of Revelation. Okay, that, that actually determines how you're going to view um, uh, the end timeline. So, there's two. What is it, basically? Symbolically or literally? Okay, if you read, you can read the book of Revelation symbolically. As I said, as I'm, I'm not uh, criticizing people who actually do it one way or another. I'm just saying there are two views. You either take it symbolically or you can take it literally. Um, I went to a theological college is very, which is very conservative. Have you heard of Moore Theological College in Sydney? Mm. So I am like Anglican background, conservative, evangelical, Calvinistic, never talk about Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why I'm doing House of Prayer, you see? <laughs> <laughs> and, and end time. How, we talk about end time, but the a, a millennium, take our revelation as symbolic and so on. I went to uh, IHOP and then uh, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And I heard the teaching from Mike Bickle at the time. This is about 10 years ago. And I, my wife was sitting ne right next to me listening to this. And we looked at each other and said, either this guy is a complete heretic <laughs> or I've missed something completely. <laughs> That's the c two conclusion. I could, there was no gray area. So what I did when I came back to, uh, to Sydney, Australia, I started studying the Bible for myself. I started reading the book of Revelation. I need to be convicted one way or another, you know, because mm. I'm, a, I'm a teacher and pastor, so I need to teach about these things if it's important. And then, um, then I need to be on one, you know, I need to have clear understanding of how the what Bible says. What really got me uh, to think that this is literal is because... because Five times in the book of Revelation, it says this is book of prophecy. Okay. Chapter one, I think twice, one or twice, and last two chapters or so, five times altogether. So then I had to ask myself, how do I, how do I, need, how do I take book of uh, prophecy in the Bible? So if you take prophecies in the Old Testament, do you take that literally or symbolically? Okay. So Zechariah 9, 9, Jesus enters into, the temp, uh, into Jerusalem, on a donkey, a false back, all right? When they actually, Old Testament people read that, do you think they took, they took that as symbolically or literally? Literally. Yeah. Well, actually, some people thought it was symbolic. How can the Messiah enter into Jerusalem <laughs> on a donkey? It has to be a white horse or something, <laughs> right? I'm thinking that it's both, but I mean, I'm just saying there will be a division. But what happened? It actually literally happened. So in other words, every single prophecy in the Old Testament that has not happened yet has to happen in the future. So how am I going to take uh, this book of Revelation which says this is a book of prophecy? So I, you guys probably have to make the same, same you know, decision somehow one way or another. Um, so I couldn't but say this has to be literal. And from then on, all my study has to come from that perspective and that's how I'm going to take it today as well. Okay, are you, are you happy with that? Are you, are you okay with that? All right, so the other thing is this. There's four perspectives on Revelation, how you can actually look at it, practically. And these are four things. Have you heard of this before? Yeah. Preterist, Futurist, Historicist, and Idealist. Would you like to know what they all are? Yeah. I'm gonna, I didn't draw this. I stole it from uh, Google. But it's pretty good. So this is how it works. So, preterists are those people who believe all the things that happen in the book of Revelation has already happened, okay? Around Jesus' death and, and resurrection and all that. And they try to fit that in. There are people who are like that. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's how they view it. The second one is futurist, which means that most of those book of Revelation things, probably uh, from chapter 6 onwards, where the seal judgment happens, and maybe some of the church in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, four and five is all about uh, you know eternal throne room kind of worship and stuff. So really, it's uh, from chapter six on. It's everything that's going to be in the future. All right. 
historicist is they stretch out the book of Revelation from Jesus' time to until Jesus come back. And he stretches out all the book of Revelation and trying to fit all the events from Jesus' time to when he returns. That's what uh, historicists mean. Uh, are you following? Are you? Okay. Yeah. As I said, I'm gonna, I can give you this PowerPoint. Please uh, send it to me. The idealist is they just took it, and it's more symbolically. This is when they actually take it just for uh, some principle that I can learn from here. Like, for example, uh, one of the main reasons why they took it sy symbolically is um, those people who take the book of Revelation symbolically is because it's a, they call it apocalyptic literature. And what that means is that at that time when uh, John was actually writing, they had a lot of apocalyptic uh, kind of stories that came out and they every one of those things are very symbolic in nature for example um, in the book of revelation when they actually use certain symbol like dragon they actually tell you what the symbol is so dragon is satan right so you can actually anything that comes out in a, a book of revelation that is symbolic is actually they actually explain to you what that is okay so all these pi uh, image like picture picturesque kind of uh, stories were apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. So they put John's uh, Book of Revelation as one of the apocalyptic literature and they take that as book of, of um, uh, more symbolically, you take that meaning symbolically. And so you, you and at that time when the saints were very, uh, under a lot of persecution from the Roman Empire, uh, they believe John actually wrote it to comfort them. So you can actually take uh, Book of Revelation and give it to people who are under persecution and at any different times, like China for the last, you know, whatever, 60, 70, 100 years, or Vietnam when they're actually under persecution, and whatever, uh, and in a Muslim country. So you can do that. Of course you can do that, right? But uh, that's one way, another way to do it. So those are four things. Uh, I'm more of futurist, okay? Because I don't see many of the uh, prophecies in the book of Revelation uh, already happen. So, okay? All right. So, what other, uh, what other, uh, there's three critical, uh, what other um, events that we can talk about? Three critical events with a different interpretation include rapture, uh, second coming of Jesus, and Israel's restoration. Okay, so I'm going to talk about them a little bit. Rapture. Okay, there's three views. What are they? Pre trib, mid trib, or oh, four, sorry, post trib, and this thing called pre wrath. Have you heard of that? No. I love pre wrath, but I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> But, okay, let me just go through one first and I'll talk about pre-wrath, okay? So first one is pre-tribulation. Tribulation is the seven years of tribulation uh, and Israel, uh, for Israel, Jeremiah 30, somewhere, I can't remember, 31 or 2, talks about Jacob's trouble, okay? That's that uh, seven-year tribulation. And that seven year comes from uh, um, Daniel uh, 9.27, okay? And when he talks about the seventieth week, okay, and it also comes out a lot as uh, even in Daniel, uh, three and a half years. So it's two halves, three and a half years. Okay, so I'll talk about that a bit later on with the timeline. And so that's the tribulation here. Okay, and they call it pre-trib or pre-tribulation because they believe they actually will be raptured before this tribulation starts. Okay, pre means before. And that's rapture and then second coming before millennium kingdom. All right. Uh, Mid-trib is, of course, easy. Mid middle of the tribulation. Sometime in between uh, the tribulation. Okay. Third one, which you can't see. <laughs> I'm hesitating to see. Post-trib is after. So tribulation here. And then rapture is at the same time as the second coming. Okay. Now, pre-wrath is very similar to mid-trip, but it's this. Uh, we will be raptured before the wrath of God is released. Okay. I like that because I think it's quite biblical. Um, because who took the wrath of God for us? Jesus. Jesus. So really, we shouldn't receive the wrath of God, whether it's end time or not. Does that make sense? So I certainly know that we will not be uh, here, uh, we meaning the believers, the true believers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, will not be in bold judgment, bold judgment. Because bold judgment is for the Antichrist uh, kingdom and it, is, it says it's, this is wrath of God. This is when the wrath of God. 
Uh, now, uh, apart from that, it becomes a little bit uh, kind of not sure where exactly. Um, there's another clue. After, on the sixth seal, okay, in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, it actually talks about um, the people, the kings and so on. People say, oh, the rocks fall on us. We want to die, basically. Fall on us. Because the wrath of the Lamb of God and of God, of God, of God is, is about to come. Okay? So some people believe that we will be raptured just around that time. So around six seal. Okay? But some, some people actually believe the whole tribulation, seven years tribulation, is the wrath of God and therefore pre-trib. So I am kind of from pre-trib <laughs> to wherever the wrath of God begins. I don't know where. So I'm around there. Okay? I, I, I love pre-trib. <laughs> okay, free trip's great, and there are there are uh, some evidence for that. There really are. Okay, I can give you some verses. You can talk to me about it, but uh, later on. But th there is evidence for pre trip, but certainly I reckon it's pre wrath. Okay, so mm. it does it help? That, is this helping you guys to understand a bit more? Um, you want to get to the exciting bit, hey? Rapture, the second coming. So second coming is about pre-mill, post-mill, and a-mill, and I have another picture for that, which is easy. So pre-millennium, uh, that's the first coming, and then Jesus comes, and then he sets up a thousand years of reign, millennium. So it's actually Jesus coming before millennium, pre-mill. Okay? Post-mill is when Jesus firstly comes, but we actually set up a thousand years of reign, and then Jesus comes, and there will be a final judgment, like white throne judgment, for example. All right. Yeah. yeah there are people who take that. They don't actually call it post mill, but uh, there's other kind of, I think, things like over realized eschatology is related to all that stuff. Amiel is, as I said, where I was before. Uh, millennium kingdom is not literal thousand years, and therefore uh, we are in millennium kingdom because Jesus reigns from heaven. And we are his saints. So I know that the kingdom of God has come, hasn't he? Hasn't it? Right? But not yet fully. So that millennium kingdom, it's not a thousand literal years, but it's just the reign of Jesus, and then Jesus will come. Mm. So those are the three different things. Okay? You can actually look at them when I actually send you the PowerPoint if you actually uh, study them better. Okay, lastly, Israel's restoration. Wow, I'm going really quick. All right, Israel's restoration. There's a few views on that. Do you know that? Okay, firstly, uh, I talked about this before. Church is the restoration of Israel. In other words, replacement in theology. We talked about it already. The second one is there are people who actually believe in literal restoration of Israel. Okay, they do, but they don't think the present worldwide gathering is it. So they don't think... This is the worldwide gathering that God is actually um, uh, going to use to actually restore, restore Israel. Okay? The reason why they say that is because in the Bible, mostly it says the national salvation has, happens before the restoration of the land happens. Okay? What it means is that Israel will really literally believe in God and believe in the Messiah and they actually worship God, and then the land will be restored. And there are verses that you can have a look at in that. But that actually is, that's how I think it is. Okay? That's how it works. So, um, and this is, I'm, I'm not saying this, I'm actually with a view, view B, but I have another one there. The third one is this. The present worldwide gathering is the restoration of Israel, because the tribulation has already happened. Things like Holocaust, and oh, including those things. So this is the final restoration of Israel. So we pray. It's like Psalm 122. What's Psalm 122? Pray for peace of Jerusalem. Because you'll be prosperous. <laughs> Do you know what Psalm 122 is all about? It's house of the Lord. Okay, house of the Lord. Why do you pray for peace in Jerusalem? Because house of God is there. Okay. It's a dwelling place of God. Is Jerusalem like that at the moment? Hmm, okay. So, so fourth thing is my talk.
I'll finish early for you, Glenn. <laughs> so it, today is more of a teaching to uh, the background of things. Uh, and uh, so I'll give you the diagram. This is it. But this is the second w one. The first, the other one that I'm going to show you tomorrow is the it. Okay. <laughs> so that's the timeline I have. And that's uh, Israel, initially the Old Testament Israel kind of time period. And you have church age. And then you have seven years, Jacob trouble or tribulation. Mm. And then you have Millennium Kingdom. And then you have New Jerusalem. Okay, that's just straightforward in the Bible. Uh, I, I re I'll put a gap there <coughs> because I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist, so they're not in proportion timeline. <laughs> So I put a gap, if you, people understand. You understand, you're an engineer? Yeah. <laughs> so first coming is right there, okay? And that's the second coming. He's going to come as a king, and he's going to rule from there, right? And then your kingdom. And that's kind of, I put it up there because uh, there's an increase in number of people being saved. So the church age is increasing. And there's rapture. Uh, Jesus will come in, in his cloud. So I don't know where rapture is, so I actually put a question mark there. <laughs> Anywhere between pre-trib to mid-trib there. And uh, we'll be with Jesus until he comes back coming and he will be ruling with him. Okay? And that's about where now, uh, where we are. I just said we are about here, wherever. That might, it's not in proportion again. One of the very important date we consider is 1948. What happened in 1948? Israel became a, a nation, a real nation. Another one is what? Another date. 67. Why is 1967 important? Jerusalem became under control of Israel. Okay. Okay. So that, that is important. Why is Donald Trump's uh, declaration that the U.S. Embassy will be in Jerusalem important, do you think? And uh, yeah, so there's other things that I, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So that's uh, first coming. And around 7 AD, what happened? Destruction, destruction. destruction of the temple and therefore scattering happened. Okay, one of the very important um, chapter uh, for Israel's kind of praying for Israel as well as uh, the way Israel is going to work, if you like, plan of God, is Leviticus 26. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 and 31 is similar, but Leviticus 26 is this. It's about blessing and cursing. Okay? If you do this, I'll bless you. But in the cursing, he says this. If you don't do this, then I will punish you. Okay? And still, if you don't do this, I will give, greater, give you greater punishment, like plagues and stuff like that. Then if you don't do that, I'll do it seven times more, stronger. And if you do not do that, I'm going to do it seven times even more. And finally, what does he do? If you don't listen, I'll scatter you. And that's why what, that's what happened. I'll scatter you all over the world. And then what it says, what he says is this. If you repent, if you repent, then I'll restore you back. Okay. Is Israel repenting? No. So, okay, there's another clue there. But who is, a, who is one of the most important um, prayer who restored the second temple? Or the, the return of Jerusalem after 70 uh, years of exile? Daniel. Daniel 9. Daniel 9, the 70th week uh, prophecy that was given by, angel, by the angel, right, was given straight after what? that prayer, when he actually prayed for restoration of Jerusalem. He was reading Jeremiah, and they actually found out, well, he found out that after 70 years, years God's going to restore Jerusalem and the temple. So what does he do? He prays and intercedes, exactly like Leviticus. So we did this, Lord. Me and my, fa my forefathers, we did this. We repent. Leviticus, again, you actually said, in the word of God, and he's, I think he's talking about Leviticus 20, you said when this happens, you are going to scatter us. Exactly. We repent. Mm -hmm. right? And then he, he actually interceded and said, Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. 
in your right, in your in, in your in your wrath, have mercy and restore your people, your city, your nation. Restoration of Israel. Okay. Daniel nine. Daniel nine is one of the greatest prayer in the Bible intercession, and it's straight out of the Word of God. He just repeated. He agreed with God. He said, "Yes, you did right, Lord. You were right about this. You were right about this." And we actually, you said to repent, so I'm actually going to repent, and please, Lord, restore. Intercession is all about agreeing with what God says. Repenting is agreement at the end. Okay? So, 70 AD, they scattered because they basically rejected the Messiah that they've been waiting for. Okay? And so, there's a scattering there. <laughs> scattering. Are you liking my picture? <laughs> it took me ages to draw this. <laughs> You'll see, you see the, next, the next one. So 1948, the land got restored to Israel. Uh, and uh, we are about here. So from then onwards, there has been what? Gathering, hasn't it? Back to the land. Right? So they're now gathering. So... A lot of people take that as restoration of Israel. But look at it. Look at where we're heading. What's that? We're actually heading for Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, not we, but Israel. The next event that happens in Israel is Jacob's trouble. When is this going to be restored? So how should we be praying? And that was my problem. How do, how do we need to, how can, how can we pray for them now? You know, because Messianic Kingdom, Millennium Kingdom is there. So between the gathering now that's happening in Israel mm. and the Millennium Kingdom or Messianic Kingdom, there's a huge bridge called Tribulation, Jacob's Trouble. What do we do? So we're heading <laughs> Jacob's Trouble. Okay. That's kind of the end of my talk, but uh, I'll continue on. And the, the tomorrow, <laughs> it's like preview for the next, isn't it? Like trailer for the movie. That's, it, that's why I put it. So tomorrow, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight here, just there, what's going to happen here. So tomorrow, what time am I speaking? Tomorrow, second or first or something like that? Yeah, it's little, uh, I think it's first up. Yeah. So... So, um, what time is that? 9 o'clock? 9.30? Yeah, something like that. So, I'll be highlighting that and I want to give you uh, what I see in the second Bible. Up, second up. Second up, sorry. So, you can sleep in a little bit more. So, <laughs> so that's what I'm going to highlight and I'm going to uh, give you as much biblical understanding to what actually happened, especially here, so that we can actually start understanding how God's going to restore uh, Israel and therefore that will give us uh, good knowledge, the biblical understanding, and hopefully also the heart of God to pray for Israel. And I think we really need to, as house of prayer, uh, prayer to pray for uh, Israel biblically and rightly in agreement with what God actually has planned for him, for them. Right? Do you agree? So let's pray. And uh, whoa, finished early. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I'm asking for spirit of revelation and wisdom to fall upon now, upon everyone who heard the message today. Father, give them a heart to seek the truth in the Word of God. Give them this hunger and, and thirst for the Word of life, Word that actually brings truth, that sets us free, free from um, ignorance, as Paul says, Lord. Sets us from just being zeal, zealous, and, and, and just enthusiastic for things. Father, we do need enthusiasm. We do need zeal. But, Father, we also need zeal with a directed in a right way. So, Father, I'm asking for a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that people may know you in a deeper and a, a more revelatory way of your heart and your desire. Not just for Israel, but for everything that is written in the Word of God. Father, I'm asking for peace tonight as people go home. Lord, let them be settled with God. Let them be in agreement with you 
in everything that we have said today, uh, the Glenn, two Glens and Amy and all the people, Lord, that has prayed. Father, we want to go home with peace, settled, that your word of God will be fulfilled when we pray. And when the word of God will be exalted as we actually are, are in agreement with it, as we study it and seek it and meditate upon it. Father, we are, I'm asking for this spirit of wisdom and revelation. And more than anything else, Father, I'm asking for the revelation of who you are to each one of us, Lord. As they, even as they sleep, Father, would you release dreams and visions, Lord Almighty God, of who Jesus is as Son of Man and Son of God. Father, we ask for Holy Spirit to just uh, land upon them and bring peace upon them, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.